On Corsica's east coast, along a narrow strip of lowland where American air bases are established, the Army is engaged in the vital work of mosquito control. A flight surgeon introduces classes to a dangerous female named Anne, Anopheles, the only mosquito that carries malaria. Famed malariologists teach the men what the disease is, how to fight it. The several hundred eggs which Anne hatches become wrigglers in a few days, tumblers a week later, and full-blown dive bombers three days after that. Symptoms of the fever hit a man about 10 days after being bitten. At first sign, he is promptly hospitalized and remains so from 14 to 40 days. In some theaters, the disease produces eight malaria victims for every battle casualty. A vicious feature of the fever is its regular recurrence. Some cases are back in the hospital 12 times in the first year after developing it. Emergency treatment does not prevent malaria, does not cure it, merely lessens the fever's effect. Anne breeds only in water, any kind of water. In salt water or fresh, clean or dirty, in swamps, ditches, ponds, streams or puddles, in vehicle tracks, footprints, coconut husks, tin cans, foxholes, in any kind of water. Hence, drainage is a prime portion of the control program. Here on Corsica, the work of removing tree stumps, brush and vegetation, and channelizing the water's flow into the sea was done by 500 Slav laborers in addition to a full organization of trained GIs. German mines infested these areas, as well as mosquitoes, made this work doubly hazardous. After drainage, ditch maintenance is of vital importance, else the ditches, improperly sprayed and cared for, may cause greater malarial nuisance than the swamps they drain. Some effective spraying was accomplished by this improvised decontaminator, capable of handling 400 gallons of diesel oil per trip and with enough pressure to force the oil through heavy vegetation. The oil film chokes and kills the larvae when, in their developing stage, they come to the surface to breathe. Hand sprayers are also used to spread the oil. In six months, from April to September, these crews spread 42,000 gallons of diesel oil. And 160 tons of Paris green and lime mixture were sprayed by planes and by hand. The dusting mixture contains varying dilutions of Paris green, from 5% by volume for hand blowers to 25% and more for airplane dusting. These concentrations of Paris green, harmless to man, lower animals, fish and vegetation, poison and kill young mosquitoes, but do not keep Anne from laying her eggs. Fine road dust, talc, powdered charcoal, or other dilutions may be used with Paris green. When the dust is thoroughly mixed, it's carried to a bin where it is stored until used. Dusting is most effective on sunny days after the dew has evaporated. When vegetation is heavy or locations are more suitable to a direct method, a hand duster is used. But for larger areas and inaccessible places, airplanes are used for dusting. A lieutenant with 12 years experience in crop dusting Kansas wheat fields chose an A-20 for the job. Built into the bomb bay, a hopper capable of taking 2,700 pounds of dust on each trip. He cut a wide Venturi-type opening through the bottom of the fuselage. This is the forward end of the Venturi. A trap door, controlled by the pilot, allows the dusting mixture to drop down into the Venturi, which sprays it behind the plane. This propeller turns a set of agitator blades inside the hopper. The blades break up lumps in the dust so that it will spread evenly. Buzzing mosquitoes at 10-foot level on their home ground is one of the most effective parts of the entire control program. This gets them in swamps, marshes, streams, lakes, in the most remote parts of the valley. Some portions of the valley, too large to be handled in the six months period, were simply placed out of bounds to troops. Posted danger signs made the malaria-conscious soldier avoid them like minefields. Areas near campsites were principal district sprayed since Anne's normal operating range is only about a mile.
But the best unit control breaks down unless every man helps. Personal precautions are still the surest means of avoiding infection. This means using anti-mosquito weapons as automatically as other weapons. Atabrine is a weapon, and meals afford a convenient roster check to dispense it. It won't prevent malaria, but it will prevent the feeling of sickness. It will keep up a man's energy to work and fight as long as he takes his daily dose. To linger in the moonlight, wearing shorts is very cool, but it guarantees malaria. Put long trousers on, you fool. Repellents are weapons. New army repellents apply to skin and clothing, discussed and for three or four hours at a stretch. And clothing should cover all parts of the body, especially after dusk. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, went to bed with little on. She didn't use her skeeter net. Now little Mary's gone. The skeeter net is a weapon, one of the most important items of anti-malaria equipment. It should be carefully inspected. Holes should be promptly sealed with tape or sewn even pinched together and tied if necessary. Care must be taken that sharp points on the bed frame do not catch or tear the netting. And when not in use, the net should be folded carefully back over the frame. The aerosol bomb spray is a weapon. Properly used, it kills every mosquito in the average sized room in four seconds. Spraying it before going to bed kills any mosquitoes inside the net. Easy to use, it's sprayed toward all corners, or can be used wherever a man takes shelter at night. The net should be tucked in properly and so arranged that the body doesn't touch it and let Anne bite from the outside. In the final analysis, the success of any malaria control program depends on the intelligent cooperation of the individual. swollen rivers snarl allied supply routes as heavy autumnal downpours bring flood and destruction to northern Italy. With roads already under three feet of water, the raging Umbrone River has washed out the Bailey Bridge at Pistoia, 20 miles northwest of Florence. This bridge is part of Highway 66, the main ammunition and supply route from Legon to Florence and the frontline units of the 5th Army. A new, more permanent structure replacing the Bailey Bridge is being rushed to completion by American engineer units as clearing skies enable road drainage to begin. Large-scale movement in the front areas is almost impossible. Before the rains reach their height, sharp enemy counterattacks supported by flamethrowers and heavy mortar barrages were reported against forward allied positions southwest of Castel San Pietro. During the floods, all front operations are confined to patrol activities only. Heaviest inundation was at Florence, where whole units had to be evacuated from sites which were underwater. The flood struck suddenly, covering a wide area in a few hours. Here at the Florence Air Base, aircraft were left standing on taxi strips. Allied engineers worked at top speed, blasting channels to divert floodwaters, racing against time to get units like this radar station back into operation. In a few days, washed out supply roads had been made usable. Sodden equipment dried and reconditioned. No change had occurred in frontline positions, but as water damaged planes and air bases awaited repair, lifting weather saw intensified air activity launched from other Italian bases that had escaped the flood. French forces of the interior at Figeac, 75 miles northeast of Toulouse, receive ammunition and supplies by air on Bastille Day, July 14th. Fighter-escorted flying forts drop from 17,000 feet 
down to 500 to assure accuracy in parachuting the supply containers. For months, 8th Air Force heavies had carried on the work of supplying French resistance troops with thousands of tons of arms, ammunition, and other equipment. But the news and this film had been withheld to keep Nazis from knowing the size and character of French preparations. Smoke pots burning on the borders of the target area guided the planes. And a T-shaped marker identified the exact spot supplies were to be dropped. At the proper instant, the lead plane fired flares and the containers were released. These flights require extraordinary skill and courage. Flying under the most difficult navigational conditions, pilots had to find pinpoints at which the French Patriots were waiting. On this particular mission, Three runs were made over the target, and all containers fell in the prescribed area. The faulty release of a chute jammed one bomb bay. The achievement of these sorties was excellent, broadened the scope of Maquis operations, and accounted in great measure for the quick success of the Allied invasion in southern France. At Namur, the railroad bridge over the Meuse River was effectively knocked out as part of the Allies' systematic destruction of bridges in France and Belgium to hinder the Nazis as they attempted withdrawal to Germany. During the last of September, Air Force cameras appraised some of this damage. The proximity of this bridge to the heart of the town caused many houses to be demolished. Generally, however, bridges were pinpointed so unerringly that townspeople were amazed at Allied marksmanship. Knocking down all rail bridges along a river or other natural barrier established lines of interdiction, isolating particular areas. This technique confined the enemy to zones, and as he struggled to escape this trap, his retreating troops and supplies were methodically reduced. At Dinan, another rail bridge along the Meuse River fell to the interdiction campaign. Here, a footbridge was incorporated into the main structure. While these bridges were being smashed, bombings continued to saturate rail yards. This constant pounding lowered operating efficiency and forced a diversion of men and equipment to keep the system open for military traffic. Forced to use motor vehicles and roads, the harried enemy became even more vulnerable to bombing and strafing. At Bouillon, the road bridge over the Semois River was destroyed. Leading to a span of the demolished bridge is a newly constructed footbridge over which traffic of a sort can be maintained. Thus, irreplaceable motor and rail stock clogged at dead-end bridge, hampered the flow of enemy supplies. Then, depleted by constant air attack, shedding men and equipment at every step, the Wehrmacht pulled out, finding no bridges to cross when they came to them. Mang Shep was by Mitchell's on October 3rd. The 25s dropped red pounders on Jap barracks in the big storage area here. Mang Shi was made a strong base when the Japs fell back from Lung Ling, 30 miles northeast. There was no fighter interception. Akak -ak was light, exploding a thousand feet below the formation, and all planes returned safely. Bomb pattern ran north to south through the target's middle area. On November 19th, China captured Mang Shi, then drove 23 miles southwest to capture Che Fang strongest remaining Jap position on this Burma Road front. The railjet Pen Mena was bombed by on October 26th. This bridge on the famous Burma Railways just south of Mandalay was missed on previous strikes, although the railroad tracks to its approach were badly torn up. This time, the pattern of the first box of planes fell 300 feet south of the bridge in the river and on the east bank. Bombing altitude was 4,000 feet. Other South Burma railways and airfields were raided the same day by 45 lightning-escorted B-25s. More than 65 tons of bombs were dropped. Pattern of the second box ran up the approach to the bridge with a few hits on the tracks.
On November 6th, enemy supplies and stores at Town Gup were attacked by Fenny based bombers. Each of the 11 Mitchells dropped 22 100 pound general purpose bombs from 10,000 feet. In every instance, the pattern started short of the target and ran across the entire area. These pictures are of the second box only. Meager Ak Ak burst above the formation. The whole Town Gup Town Gu area was attacked this day by approximately 60 B 25s, which dropped more than 55 tons of bombs. On November 9th, Fenny based Mitchells were over one foe. This target was a military area, and the object of the raid was to prevent Jap personnel and supplies from reaching the battlefront. Weather to the target was clear. First elements bombed from a position just short of the target to its center. Bombs of the second element ran from a point just north of the railroad in the target area to a pagoda which is thought to have been destroyed. General purpose bombs were fused one tenth nose, one fortieth tail. 96 burst within the target area. On November 10th, Finley Boo in the upper Chin Dwin was hit by Fenny based Mitchells. Each ship carried six 500 pound general purpose bombs. A Jap camp and stores area were targets. Bombs from the first box started short and to the right, but extended well into the target area. Second pattern started short, walked through the center of the target area. On November 12th, Kinu in the lower Chindwin was hit by 24 Fenny based Mitchells. Kinu, near Shwebo, is a reinforcement center for Jap ground forces fighting in Burma. Each plane dropped 22 100 pound general purpose bombs on the military stores area, loading point for the many truck convoys that were spotted en route. British figures disclose current operations on the Burma front have cost the Japs 54,000, not counting the dead the Japs buried or those who died from disease or wounds. 